And so it was, late in the 20th century, that a pox fell upon the land, a plague of home videos that were limited in intelligence. There was brain drain, and terminal boredom swept the countryside. The maker looked down and was not pleased by what he saw and said, this is not good. And so it was, he brought forth Genesis. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Player One Start. Today is a very special episode as we are going to start kicking off our 16-bit war with the Ultimate Sega Genesis Review. And let's just get this out of the way. So, in every other part of the world other than North America, the Sega Genesis was named the Mega Drive. It actually was renamed the Genesis specifically for the North American video game market so it can better compete with the Nintendo Entertainment System. But for all intents and purposes, this is the same exact console that everyone else heard of except for I always refer to it as the Sega Genesis. And as this is the way I grew up with the console, I'm going to go ahead and refer to it as the Sega Genesis, mainly for the rest of this review. But before we get too far into it, if this is your first time here, don't forget to click that like and subscribe button. It really helps me out and supports this channel. But now that we got that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. In 1987, Sega was losing an uphill battle to Nintendo for superiority in the home video game market. Earlier in the 1980s, Sega Enterprises Inc., then a subsidiary of Gulf & Western, was one of the top five arcade manufacturers active in the United States, as company revenues surpassed $200 million between July of 1981 and June of 1982. A downturn in the arcade business starting in 1982 seriously hurt the company, leading Gulf & Western to sell its North American arcade manufacturing organization and licensing the rights for its arcade games to Bally Manufacturing. The company retained Sega's North American R&D operation, as well as its Japanese subsidiary, Sega Enterprises Limited. With its arcade business in decline, Sega Enterprises Limited president, Hayao Nakayama, advocated that the company leverage its hardware expertise to move into the home console market in Japan, which was in its infancy at the time. Nakayama received permission to proceed with this project, leading to the release of Sega's first home video game system, the SG-1000, in July of 1983. While its initial sales exceeded expectations, sales at stores were mainly dominated by Nintendo's Famicom, which had been released the same day. Sega estimated that the Famicom outsold the SG-1000 by a 10 to 1 margin. The following year, Nakayama and Sega CEO David Rosen arranged a management buyout of the Japanese subsidiary in 1984. Nakayama was then installed as the CEO of Sega Enterprises Limited. In 1985, Sega would replace the SG-1000 with the Mark III. This console would be redesigned and renamed for the North American release as the Sega Master System in 1986, followed by a European release with the same name the following year. Although the Sega Master System was a success in Europe and later in Brazil, it failed to ignite significant interest in the Japanese or North American video game markets, which, by the mid to late 1980s, were both dominated by Nintendo. With Sega continuing to have difficulty penetrating the home video game market, Sega's console R&D team began work on a successor to the Master System almost immediately after that console launched. In 1987, Sega faced another threat to its console business when Japanese computer giant NEC released the PC Engine to great fanfare. To remain competitive against the two more established consumer electronics companies, the R&D team decided they needed to incorporate a 16-bit microprocessor into their new system to make an impact in the marketplace. They once again turned to Sega's strengths in the arcade industry to adapt the successful Sega 16 system arcade board into the architecture of the home console. 
The decision to use a Motorola 68000 as the system's main CPU was made late into development, while a Zilog Z80 was used as a secondary CPU to handle the sound, due to fears that the load to the main CPU would be too great if they handled both the visuals and the audio. The use of the 68000 chip, though, did cause problems. It was expensive, and would have driven the retail price of the console up greatly. However, Sega was able to negotiate with the distributor for special pricing. The deal granted Sega to get an upfront volume order of chips for a tenth of its price, with the promise of more orders pending on the console's future success. Regarding the console's physical design, one of the Sega R&D members stated that they base the console's design on the appearance of an audio player, and presents the tech's 16-bit embossed in golden metallic veneer to give the impression of power. Sega first announced their new console, originally referred to as the Mark V, in a June 1988 issue of Japanese gaming magazine Beep. But Sega management wanted a much stronger name than Mark V. After reviewing more than 300 proposals, the company settled on the name Mega Drive. Again, when making its way to North America, the console was renamed, this time to Genesis. The exact reason for this change is not known, however many sources state that this was done to avoid trademark license issues. The Mega Drive would also get physical alterations as well, however these changes were not as drastic as the Sega Master System before it. Again, Sega R&D members stated that some of the aesthetics had to change, such as the gold-colored 16-bit wording. One of the leaders of Sega R&D stated that he believed the changes in design are representative of the differences in values between Japanese and American culture. Sega released the Mega Drive in Japan on October 29, 1988, though the launch was largely overshadowed by Nintendo's release of Super Mario Bros. 3 a week earlier. The console received much positive coverage from the media in Japan, helping to establish a following. But Sega had only managed to ship 400,000 units in the first year. In order to increase sales, Sega released various peripherals and games, including an online banking system and answering machine called the Sega Mega Answer. When Sega announced a North American release date for the system on January 9th of 1989, Sega did not possess a North American sales and marketing organization, having previously distributed its master system through Tonka. Dissatisfied with Tonka's performance, Sega looked for a new partner to market the Genesis in North America, and offered rights to Atari Corporation, which did not yet have a 16-bit system. David Rosen made the proposal to Atari CEO Jack Trammell and the president of Atari's Entertainment Electronics division, Michael Katz. Trammell declined to acquire the new console, deeming it too expensive, and instead opted to focus on the Atari ST. Sega decided to launch the console through its own Sega of America subsidiary, which had executed a limited launch on October 14th of 1989 in New York City and Los Angeles. The Genesis was released in the rest of North America later that year. This new technology made its nationwide debut in Manhattan with Donald Trump on hand as kids and parents challenged each other to Sega's newest games, Tommy Lasorda's Baseball and Altered Beast. The 16-bit microprocessor allows for enhanced graphics, stereo sound. You now have a game that is richly enhanced a game that uh, is very, very similar to that that you would find in the arcade. I love it. I think it's great. This is the best I've ever seen. I like it. It's pretty cool. The European version of the Mega Drive, keeping its name, was released in September of 1990. The release was handled by Virgin Mastertronic, which was later purchased by Sega in 1991 and became Sega of Europe. Other companies assisted in distributing the console to various countries worldwide. Ozasoft handled the Mega Drive's launch and marketing in Australia, as it had done before with the Master System. In Brazil, the Mega Drive was released by Tech Toy in 1990, only a year after the Brazilian release of the Master System. Tech Toy would go on to produce games exclusively for the Brazilian market, and began a network service for the system called Sega Meganet in 1995. In India, Sega entered a distribution deal with Shaw Wallace in the spring of 1995 in order to circumvent an 80% import tariff. Samsung handled sales and distribution in Korea, where it was renamed the Super Gam Boy and retained the Mega Drive logo along the Samsung name. It was later renamed Super Aladdin Boy. 
In the United States, the system came bundled with Altered Beast, which was two years old at the time. However, it was hoped that this would drive sales of the console, seeing how close it was to its arcade counterpart. There were five other games available at launch, Space Harrier 2, Last Battle, Super Thunderblade, Tommy Lasorda Baseball, and Thunder Force 2. Part of the purpose of this launch lineup was to showcase how close they could get to the arcade games in the home, but another purpose was the fact that most of these titles were games that players had already heard of. Dave Whitney wanted the real arcade games at home, so he got them. Mike Rogers wanted them too, but he got a Genesis system by Sega. Why? Check it out. Arcade screen left, Genesis screen right. If they look the same, you've answered correctly. It was hoped that these aspects would help drive sales of the console. In October of 89, Michael Katz was installed as Sega of America's new CEO after leaving Atari Corporation. Upon taking the new position, he instituted a new two-part approach to build sales in North America. The first part involved a marketing campaign to challenge Nintendo head-on, and emphasize the more arcade-like experience available on the Genesis, summarized by the slogans including, Genesis does what Nintendo don't. Since Nintendo owned the console rights to most arcade games of the time, the second part of his strategy involved creating a library of instantly recognizable games that used the names and likenesses of celebrities and athletes, such as Pat Riley's Basketball, Arnold Palmer's Tournament Golf, James Buster Douglas's Knockout Boxing, Joe Montana Football, as well as Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. Nakayama set the goal for Cats and Sega of America to sell 1 million units within the first year. However, they would only half meet that goal, only selling about 500,000 units. In mid-1990, Nakayama hired Tom Kalinske to replace Katz as CEO of Sega of America. Although Kalinske initially knew very little about the video game market, he surrounded himself with industry-savvy advisors. Kalinske initially developed and implemented a four-part plan. Cut the price of the console. Create a US-based team to develop games targeted toward the American market. Continue and expand the aggressive advertising campaigns. And replace the bundled game Altered Beast with a new game, Sonic the Hedgehog. The Japanese board of directors initially disapproved of the plan, but all four points were approved by Nakayama, who told Kalinske, I hired you to make the decisions for Europe and the Americas, so go ahead and do it. Magazines of the time praised Sonic as one of the greatest video games made yet to date. And Sega's console finally took off as customers who have been waiting for the release of the international version of Nintendo Super Famicom decided to purchase a Genesis instead. This would all lead to what eventually would become Sega's greatest success in the home video game market. Danita Stokes, president of HAG. It's bad enough that Sega Genesis has the most 16-bit games, but this new Sonic the Hedgehog, oh, he really dust my doilies. They say he's incredibly fast. Well, what's the hurry, mister? Hmm? Why can't it be more like that nice boy, Mario? Oh! oh Little butt! New Sonic the Hedgehog, only on the 16-bit Sega Genesis system. Sonic the Hedgehog proved to be the killer app needed to drive sales of the Sega Genesis. Gaming magazines of the time praised Sonic as one of the greatest games yet released, and Sega's console finally took off as customers who had been waiting for the release of the international version of Nintendo's Super Famicom, later to be named the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, decided to purchase a Genesis instead. Sonic was released in June, just two months before the Super Nintendo would make its debut in North America. But due to the popularity of Sonic the Hedgehog, the Genesis was outselling the Super Nintendo in the United States nearly 2 to 1 during the following holiday season in 1991. The success led to Sega having control of 65% of the 16-bit market by January of 1992, making it the first time that Nintendo was not the console leader since December of 1985. One thing to keep in mind is that the Sega Genesis hardware was originally designed to compete with the technologically inferior Nintendo Entertainment System. And even though the aging Nintendo Entertainment System featured far less superior graphics and sound, it continued to outsell the Sega Genesis in the first couple years of its life. Part of this was due to the fact that Nintendo monopolized the market by having third parties sign an exclusivity agreement if they ever wanted to make games for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Spelled out in this agreement was that developers can only make a maximum of five games per year for the NES to keep up quality control. 
Nintendo had these strict guidelines so that they could have staying power, but also to avoid ending up like Atari after the video game crash in 1983. Even though many third-party companies weren't particularly happy with the way that Nintendo conducted its business, the fact that Nintendo controlled over 90% of the North American video game market left them with little alternative. To compete with Nintendo, Sega was more open to new types of games than its rival, but still tightly controlled the approval process for third-party games and charged high prices for cartridge manufacturing. Technicians from American third-party video game publisher Electronic Arts reverse-engineered the Genesis in 1989, following one year of negotiations with Sega in which EA had requested a better licensing agreement than was standard in the industry before releasing its games for the system. EA was very careful when reverse engineering the console to not violate any copyright restrictions that would prevent them from making their own game cartridges. Just before the 1990 Consumer Electronics Show, EA founder Trip Hawkins confronted Nakayama with this information, noting that EA now had the ability to run its own licensing program if Sega refused to meet its demands. Sega relented, and the next day EA's upcoming Genesis games were showcased at CES. With this agreement, Electronic Arts had more control over the manufacturing of their cartridges, they could make as many titles as they want, they could approve their own titles without having to wait for Sega, and they paid less in royalties to Sega. One of the first titles released, just before the end of 1990, was Job Madden Football, which became a killer app for the system. Due to the Genesis having a two-year lead on the market, a lower price point, and a larger game library when compared to the Super Nintendo at its release, Sega was able to outsell Nintendo four Christmas seasons in a row. However, through most of the console's early life, the Nintendo Entertainment System was still the leader. Sega's advertising positioned the Genesis as the cooler console. As its advertising evolved, the company coined the term Blast Processing, which suggested that its processing capabilities were far superior to those of the Super Nintendo. As the console wars heated up, the perception of each console became even more important, as they tried to show how their systems were superior to one another. And this even led their marketing departments to deceive consumers on how many consoles they were actually selling. For this reason, it is not easy to look back and see exactly where Sega was dominating over Nintendo. However, Sega's dominance wouldn't last forever. Part of what made the Sega Genesis so successful was the fact that it was perceived as being on the cutting edge. First, it was touted as being the technologically superior console to the aging 8-bit Nintendo Entertainment System. However, when Nintendo released its Super Nintendo Entertainment System, Sega lost its huge lead technology-wise. To stay ahead of Nintendo, Sega announced that they were going to release a peripheral that would vastly increase the capabilities of the Sega Genesis. What followed was the release of the Sega CD. And although this peripheral did not sell as well as Sega had hoped, it did allow Sega to keep marketing the Genesis as the technologically superior console over both the Super Nintendo Entertainment System and the TurboGrafx-16, which also had its own CD peripheral. When Nintendo hinted at their own CD peripheral add-on, Sega planned and released another add-on to the Genesis as a stopgap measure to bridge the gap between the 16-bit Genesis and their next 32-bit console, the Sega Saturn. This add-on ended up being the Sega 32X. And again, the add-on was a commercial failure, while the Sega Genesis still continued to sell strong. Eventually, Nintendo would scrap their CD-based add-on, opting to put additional hardware inside of the cartridges to increase the performance of their system. Sega ended up doing this as well, but since they already had a peripheral that could provide 32-bit graphics on the 16-bit system, they ended up scrapping the project after releasing one game. But advanced hardware was only one aspect of Sega's appeal to gamers in the early to mid-90s. While Nintendo focused a lot of their marketing towards children, Sega went in another direction. Keeping with their philosophy that Sega was the cooler console over Nintendo, they also claimed it was more adult, emphasizing games more aimed at teenagers and young adults. One example was the Sega Genesis port of the game Mortal Kombat. While the Super Nintendo removed all references of blood and gore, the Sega Genesis port kept all of it in, although it did have to be accessed with a password. But since kids were still the main audience for video games back in the mid-90s, this landed Sega into trouble, eventually prompting action by the US Senate to force the video game industry to come up with a rating system that would let parents know what content was in the video games their kids were buying. Many games featured in the Senate hearings were published on Sega's console. And although Sega always maintained that they were not marketing these more adult games towards kids, this only seemed to increase Sega's appeal amongst rebellious kids and teenagers. Although these aspects are major factors in what led to Sega's success, they were also as equally important in Sega's downfall. But that's a story for another time.
So there are actually many parts to the history of the Sega Genesis, and right now I'm only focusing on its early history. And also, since this is a review of the Sega Genesis and not any of the add-ons, such as the Sega CD and the 32X, I'm actually not going to mention those, at least at first. I plan to cover those in their own review videos. But in terms of the history of just the Sega Genesis console itself, there's actually two different parts to its history as well. There's pre-1993 and post-1993. So although I'm going to be focusing on console history 1993 and before, I do plan to cover the post-1993 and the later console's life in the 16-bit war itself, so I'm actually going to cut the history short here. That's actually going to wrap it up for this part of the Ultimate Sega Genesis review. In the next part, we're actually going to do a more involved teardown of the console and take a look at graphics and sound. Remember, if you like what you see, please hit that like and subscribe button, share with a friend. Again, I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. If you like this video and you'd like to help out with future projects on this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Again, I want to thank you guys so much for watching, I'll see you next time.